Well, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out this afternoon. Um, Today is a really, really good opportunity for us to hear from a very large, just a giant in the industry, uh, someone who's, uh, ba I think, has pretty much done it all from working from part of business school to going to work with uh, General Motors, Kirsten Family Enterprises, SeaWorld, uh, written a book, been on TV. Um, there's just a lot of things of reading the book and just a very intriguing individual. And I couldn't be happier that he's here with us today. And he's one of those people, that I guess, you really could say, doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joel, uh, Joel Manby, uh, to present this afternoon. Oh, great. Thank you so much, David. It's a huge, huge pleasure for me to be here. I see uh, a lot of names on the screen that I recognize, and certainly people, if I don't know you personally, I've heard your name. And um, I, I just think it's the, the best business in the world is being in the theme park business or the theme attraction business. I spent half of my career there, the first half with an automotive ventures, uh, mostly Saab and Saturn. Um, but I was actually on the board of Saturn Corporation um, and, then, and then later Saab when I met Jack and Pete Hershend. And I, I was asked to be on their board of directors. And I fell so in love with the Hershens and how they did business that when they asked me to come into their company, uh, when Jack decided to retire as chairman after 50 years of being chairman, uh, I decided to leave the auto industry proactively and come with the Hershens. And uh, I tell you, I, I never looked back. They, are, they were just giants in the industry and such wonderful people and was there uh, 15 years basically all in and then went to SeaWorld as CEO, was recruited away from Hershend and was very open with Jack and Pete about it. They, they knew about it. They, they weren't happy, but they were also supportive because they felt like some of their principles of servant leadership and how we go about doing business could be applied to SeaWorld. So um, I just love my time in the industry and look forward to sharing a few thoughts with you. What, what, Dave, what, what Mike, in, in, who's a good friend of mine, asked him, you know, what, what should I share with David and his team? And he suggested we talk about servant leadership to a degree, but also more leading through this crisis. And how do we get to the other side of this crisis? And I know all of you have probably been through the, the most difficult year and a half, two years of your professional careers. I can say myself, even though maybe individually, let's say the SeaWorld crisis of their identity and the attacks from the animal act activists may have been more acute from uh, a six month, 12 month standpoint. I've never seen in my career what we've all gone through in the last year and a half. And I know many of you were probably close to going out of business or hanging on by dear life. I know even SeaWorld and Hershen, as large as they are and with the cash reserves they had, had very, very difficult times getting through. So I, I applaud you for getting through what you have. I know it was incredibly difficult. And what I thought I would share is from my own experience of turnarounds and crisis situations, what I did in those situations, and I tried to generalize it so it could be applicable to all of you, because if you don't learn from this and we can't dialogue together, it's, it's not beneficial to me either. So what I've done is I, I, I put down five steps to transform your culture, enhance engagement and improve the bottom line performance. And I wanna talk through those five steps. And I'm quite certain that no matter what situation you're in, there'll be applicability for you here. And let's just say that takes 20 minutes or so. Uh, then I wanna open up for Q and A. So please, as I'm going through the, the talking head part where I'm, I'm talking to you, please jot down questions because what I love and what I really get engaged with and about is the questions afterwards of your situation specifically or any thoughts you have on Hershend or SeaWorld and, and what I've done in the past. So I'm just going to dive in and go through those five points and then we can open it up for Q&A. Um, the first step in transforming a culture or the business in a pivot that we all have to look at right now is to define it specifically. 
And by the, by the way, I don't, I don't have a PowerPoint. I just thought that was less engaging. I'm going to send out a PDF afterwards, probably tomorrow with an outline of this. So if you don't want to take notes, you don't have to, but on the other hand, um, uh, I, I will send that out tomorrow. So the first step is to define it specifically. And I'm going to talk about two different aspects of that. First, the vision, but then the culture, because they're both incredibly important. Most of you, if you're like SeaWorld or Hershen right now, had to do some pivoting. You're either reopening at half capacity or you had to pivot. And I think what's really important is to keep thinking about that there's opportunity in every crisis. It's, it's very easy to get down or to get depressed that man, man, my business is never going to be the same. But let's face it, every crisis, every opportunity creates an opportunity and I, I think about, uh, although this is dated a bit, but when I was in the auto industry and Saturn was started, it was, it was a vision to make a terrible car buying process, which was negotiation and very unpleasant. I mean, let's face it, buying a car is like getting a root canal. Um, it was to make it pleasant. So the opportunity was let's take a really unpleasant process and make it fun make it enjoyable. When I was, when I was at Hershend, it was how do we take this family culture that is so tremendous, but as we were acquiring companies and trying to turn them around, their cultures were so bad that we had to paint a vision for what it could be. So think about for whatever your business is, what is wrong with it today? And how can I fix it to make it better? How can I pivot it? And, and maybe for some of you, you don't need to, you're going to go right back to the same model and that's okay. But for some of you, what, look at it positively. How can we make this business model better? And then be passionate about it and get the buy-in of your teams. Because so many times I see entrepreneurs or small businesses, the, the leader and the entrepreneur is heading down a path, but hasn't taken the time to really talk through the vision talk through what's wrong and how we're going to fix it and to be passionate about it. So from a vision standpoint, that's the first step. From a cultural standpoint, um, there's, there's two things to think about there, the do goals and the be goals. And every company I've been in in my entire life has do goals. And it's what most of you think about when you're thinking about what do I have to accomplish? It's cash flow, it's profitability, it's sales growth. So my guess is you have those pretty much taken care of. Where 90% of the companies I've consulted with, led, helped turn around, where they fall flat is on the B goals. And what B goals are is what kind of leader and what kind of leadership culture do you want to have? And it's usually a behavior. It's not a feeling. It's how do I want my employees to be treated? How do I want the guests to be treated? How do I want to treat fellow, fellow leaders? And at least for me, what I find is most companies don't go through this process to identify this clearly. Um, from the Gallup research, Gallup has been measuring employee culture for probably 50 years now. Their statistics say that 70% of organizations define values, but after that they do nothing. And so literally 90% of the companies do nothing after that and only 70% have a really crisp uh, identification of their values. So it's just something to think about from a vision standpoint, what, is our, what do we want our culture to be, but also what do we want our vision to be? And the last point I'd make on number one is the, the other thing I see a lot of um, leaders and executives underperform on is thinking about marketing versus culture. So I think this is a really critically important point. And I was taught this by Joe Kennedy, who's a great friend of mine from, from business school. We went to Harvard together, but then he, he ran uh, Saturn for a while, but then he went to Pandora and helped start Pandora Radio, um, which obviously is incredibly successful. He, he said that marketing vision is the external messaging of what you want your customers to believe about your organization. That's marketing. 
What vision do I want my customer to believe about my company or your company? Internally, culture is what you want your employees to feel about the country, uh, about the company. And so they absolutely should be the same thing. What you're teaching customers to believe about you from a marketing perspective should absolutely match up with what you want your employees to think about you. One's marketing and one's culture. They are, they both have to be consistently and constantly reinforced. And again, I think if I, if I look at my own career, the people I've worked with, where I see leaders tend to fail is they don't put enough effort on those two thoughts. It's, it's marketing and culture, and it has to be consistently and constantly reinforced. And by consistent, I mean, let's face it, most of the culture issues in companies involve typically a leader who might hit the do goals, they might hit the financial numbers, but they do so in such a way that they're running over the employees, they're causing turnover, they're causing low morale, and, 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 and senior leadership doesn't step up to that. The only way you're gonna have a consistent culture is to hold people accountable to the B goals that I talked about earlier. So consistency means dealing with your cultural issues. Constancy means, you know, from a marketing standpoint, from a culture standpoint, you are always talking about it, always teaching it. And from my experience and including my own failures, I mean, when I say my experience, I mean, usually my own failures, it's not spending enough of the hours in the day on teaching the employees what the culture is or teaching our customers what, what their, the vision is from a marketing standpoint. So again, for number one, define it specifically, both the vision, which is external and internal marketing and culture, and also from a culture perspective, you're defining your do goals and your be goals. So that's the de definition part, probably takes the most time of everything. The second thing in a turnaround, which other than obviously, you know, there's things I don't go into in this, this little talk that are obvious to me. When you're in a crisis, cash is king. You protect cash at all costs. Um, you do have to make really difficult decisions and you have to move quickly to make those difficult decisions. But I think we're kind of through that part. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. So I'd move to the second point. If you've defined it specifically in point one, point two is to teach it repeatedly, to teach it repeatedly. And on one hand, I know that might sound obvious, but again, from my own experience and others, most people don't use enough of their leadership hours teaching others of the kind of culture and business that they want. And um, again, according to Gallup, if, if I, I said 70% of the organizations actually have B goals, only half of those, so you're talking 35% of total organizations have taken the time to teach what their culture or their vision is. And so I just, I just wanna pause and ask you a few questions that you don't need to answer. I want, I want you to answer them to yourself. Like how, if you went into a team meeting with your senior leaders or your department, and so what percent of my team can articulate the vision of our organization, can articulate the plan by which we're going to achieve that vision? What percent of them would be able to come back to you with the answer? And I, at least for me, um, I learned this at, at Hershend a lot, is I thought we were aligned but if you're 5% off at the senior leadership level, by the time you get to the frontline level, you're about 180 degrees off. And what you think is executed consistently is not. So I'm intending for you to be a little uncomfortable right now that if you're like me, I would say, man, I didn't spend enough time educating my senior team on the vision, the plan, how we're going to get there. And in my most successful times, I spent a lot of time on that and it was crystal clear. When I wasn't as successful, I didn't spend as much time on it, trying to do too much myself and not engaging the rest of the team. The, the second question I ask you is uh, on the culture piece, 
what percentage of your team, meaning your, your direct reports and, and those further out in the organization, what percentage of them could articulate your B goals, meaning your culture? And I've seen so many organizations that I've come into, you know, when I was at Hershey, we probably purchased 11 different organizations, trying to turn them around. SeaWorld was certainly a turnaround situation. I, I will tell you most of the time, employees don't have a clue where the company is headed. They don't have a clue what senior leaders are thinking about the direction of the company, clearly what's expected of them, et cetera. And at least for me, people tend to be really clear about the do goals. They know I got to hit this financial target. I know I've got to hit this margin. I got to hit this for food per cap or this um, you know, basically attractions, uh, uh, revenue per head, whatever, whatever the metric is. That's usually pretty clear. What I have found people don't understand is what's the vision and the measurement for the B goals. And so again, you've got to, you absolutely have to define it and then you have to teach it. So the third thing that um, I have found even kind of more sketchy is to measure it robustly. And again, going back to the, the Gallup data, which I've been tracking for, for most of my career, if you start with 70%, actually write their values down and put it up on a plaque on a wall somewhere, half of those teach it, but only half of those are actually down, it gets down to 10% of all organizations actually measure it robustly. And that's the third point is to measure it robustly. And what I talk about there, what I mean is the beagles. Again, I don't, I don't see a deficiency in financial metrics. Frankly, those are, are uh, sometimes overdone and most organizations have great financial metrics, profitability, sales, et cetera, where I see them fail. And the reason they have weak cultures is they don't measure their B goals robustly. So specifically what I mean by that, and um, I think it would take too long to go into it. I'm just, I'm just gonna give you some examples. At, at Hershend and at SeaWorld, we had a set of between seven and nine beagles. So let's just say, I'll give you three at Hershen. The first three were being patient, being kind, and being truthful. We actually had seven, but I'll only give you three. So those words can be vastly, vastly misinterpreted by leaders, by employees. So we actually, for each word, had three or four behaviors that were taught when I talked about teaching it, we would teach our employees what that meant. So with patience, it was not when it was not patience with poor performance, because we all have to have performance, we all have to hit our numbers. That's not what it meant. It meant patience in how you dealt with a crisis. It, uh, another sub behavior was praise in public, admonish in private. So key principle. I mean, it's, it's very easy when we're all get frustrated, we're on the front line and you know, an employee's not handling a situation right or not treating the customer right or not hitting their numbers. It's extremely easy to fly off the handle, destroy their dignity in the moment, lose your temper. And look, I, I admit that that's probably my issue of all the seven words that we use at Hershend and nine use that we, words that we used to see where probably patience was my worst. Um, because I have a little bit of a temper and I would, I would get angry, but luckily my people hold, held me accountable to it. But at Hershey, we said, okay, praise in public and monish in private. That is a behavior that we would measure each other on. So are, are you praising in public or are you admonishing in public? Are you, and then when you do admonish somebody, there actually were behaviors for that. You'll be upfront with them, don't attack their dignity, attack their performance, and just talk about the action, but not don't attack who they are and, and try to leave the admonishment so that they actually are more comfortable and are more confident than they were before. And that's, that's not an easy task. I will tell you, Jack Gershon is probably the best person on earth I've ever seen be able to talk to you and make you feel like 
you know what, I, I missed the mark here, but you still left the interaction feeling more positive about yourself than before. And I think that's incredibly important when we're in this high pace, high intensity environment. Because if you leave somebody with their dignity low, their confidence low, they're not going to continue to make the right decisions. So measuring it robustly is incredibly important. So I talked about patience. Let me just talk about, and I'll, I'll give you two more, kindness and uh, truthfulness. Kindness was not about being nice all the time. We can't, you know, we have to hold people accountable. But kindness was about showing encouragement and enthusiasm to your employees and writing them thank you notes or writing them encouragement notes. Because it's interesting to me, when, when we measured our do goals at both Hershen and SeaWorld, it always shocked me that the lowest scores our employees gave us as leaders were things that were free. They, they gave us lowest scores on, was I reinforced today? Was I given a compliment by, by leadership? Th those were always our lowest scores. It was interesting having, having the tools they needed to do the job, knowing what their job does, was or is, was pretty high. But it was the kindness part that leaders tended to fail on. And so for some reason, I don't know why in the human race, we tend to not be as encouraging. I don't know if it's we're too focused on ourselves or too focused on our own situation. But time and time again, company after company, I've seen we don't tend to treat our employees kindly enough and give them enough reinforcement. And it's hugely lacking out there. The third, the third one I promised to talk about was truthfulness, which was another behavior that defined the values at both Hirsch and SeaWorld. And that's, I'm not talking about telling the truth on financial statements or something where you're uh, obviously that's a no no brainer zero strikes there if you cheat if you lie if you steal you're out of the company what i'm talking about is the truthfulness from you to your employees so that they understand how they are performing and if they're not doing well we need to tell them and we need to give them the opportunity to improve um, when I was at General Motors in the automotive kind of culture, looking back on it, it, it was a horrific culture because no one was ever given feedback. You either you know, had a job or you were fired, but it, there was very little feedback of how you can improve. And I, I saw that as weak leadership. Leaders didn't have the chutzpah or the confidence or the, the quality to give their employees feed, honest, truthful feedback about how they were doing. And they would just get frustrated and they would let them go. At both Hershen and SeaWorld, no one could get fired at a leadership level or at a frontline level unless there was a documented reason they were getting fired. Now this, I'm not talking about, you know, certainly when the pandemic hit and there were, there were mass layoffs and you just had to, you had to make very difficult decisions from a a uh, business model standpoint, that those are unfortunate times. And that's not what I'm talking about. But when business is good, we, as far as measuring our values robustly and holding people accountable, um, they had to have some proof in their file that there was a problem before they were allowed to, to let people go. So that's when I say measure it robustly, it is having both do goals and be goals with behaviors and literally at the, at, the, at the end of the review cycle, and I gave the three examples of patience, kindness, and truthfulness, those behaviors would be on the review and the leader would review that employee of whether they're adhering to those principles or not. So it was both top down, but also came bottom up because the frontline employees also got a survey and they were asked, is your leader practicing patience, kindness, truthfulness. And so we had metrics both bottom down and top, top down and bottom up to, to measure whether leaders were adhering to the B goals. So, and, that, and that, from what I've seen, that's pretty unique, but that's the third step, measuring it robustly. The fourth step is reviewing it consistently. And now we're down into the rare stratosphere where pro I would guess maybe 5% of companies really do this. My experience, I, you know, I haven't seen many. Hershen and, and SeaWorld certainly did and, and Saab when I was in the auto industry. But what I'm talking about reviewing it consistently is both 
the do goals, the financial results, and the be goals, the behavior results of your culture. And here, here's the ultimate question. Are you, think about how much time, take your every average day as a leader. What percentage of the time are you thinking about, talking about, and in meetings about the financial performance of your organization versus how much time are you in meetings talking about, thinking about the culture results or the people results of your organization? And at least what I have found in the companies that had pristine performance results is they spend about as much time on both equally. And I think that's pretty rare. I know in the auto industry, I was there, it was probably 95% on the financials and very little time on the people scores. So literally at Hershen and SeaWorld, I would check my calendar and I was in just as many review meetings on the financial results as we were on the Beagles. So I want you to challenge yourself and think about that. Um, and here's a couple ideas of how we captured that data and talked about it. So the, I think the basics, absolute basic fundamental minimum is to have an annual review process. And I'm sure most of you have that, most, most organizations do. For Hershen and SeaWorld within the, let's call it a, about a hundred question survey, about a third of them were about the B goal values. Just are your leaders adhering to those seven or nine values respectively? That's one way. Now, we also had survey monkeys, uh, surveys uh, on survey monkey that we'd put out monthly for trouble departments. So all of our employee surveys linked back to departments and individual leaders. Although the person giving the result was anonymous, we knew what department it was one it, it was with, and so if we had a troubled department where the Beagle scores were really low, the culture scores were low, the morale was low, the engagement was low, we would go back monthly with SurveyMonkey and resurvey that. I know uh, some companies. I was just talking to some folks from from FunSpot the other day. They they have a good. I think it's a great process where monthly, even if it's not a troubled department, they're going in monthly. And they're using the more of, same as, less of process to kind of reinforce the value. So let's just say on back to patients, they would say, okay, what, what do you need to do? More of with patients, same of, or less of to get better at it. And they have that, that monthly dialogue with their employees, which I think is a fantastic process. So those are just three ideas, annual survey, um, monthly, if it's a problem, or just monthly audits with your employees to talk about how are they doing on those, those culture behaviors that you've established. And I, I'm gonna tangent here for a second. I should, I should make it clear. And the reason, the reason I haven't gone through all seven words at Hershen or all nine words at SeaWorld, you know, I, I wrote Love Works the book about the seven words at Hershen. I'm not claiming that your culture has to be those seven words or the nine words that we used at, at SeaWorld, I think it's just absolutely critical that you go through your own process and you know, revise them because of COVID, because COVID has changed things and it has changed what's important and make sure you go through your own process with your leadership team to come up with what you want your culture to be like post COVID. I know at a, um, a ministry I'm involved in as their chairman, um, we went in and added a lot about just the culture, uh, not a lot, but we added two words about the culture of working remotely, which is accountability and, and reporting. In other words, look, when you're remote, there's less trust in what's going on. So it, it behooves, it's on the employee to be very proactive in their updates to have the trust of management because of COVID. So that's just an example where Post COVID, you may have to adjust what those words are, but they should be your words. So that's that's number four, review it consistently. The last one, and um, I've seen this, I would say 99% of the organizations I've worked with through acquisition or consulting or leading, when I came in, they were not doing this. And I think it's absolutely critical, which is reward it constantly. Reward it constantly. And I'm going to talk about three different areas. 
and it's putting your money where your mouth is because how many of us have seen all right, our values are X, we put a plaque on the wall, nice set of values, leadership's inconsistent to them, and every raise, every promotion, every bonus is strictly 100% on the financial results and has no reflection of the people scores or the culture results. And I just think if you do that, you're gonna, you're gonna get what, you, what, you, what we all deserve to get in that situation. So at Hershen and at SeaWorld, we had three categories, base pay, we actually would look at a two by two matrix at the annual review. So vertical axes, think of vertical was basically, was I hitting my due goals, low to high? So if I'm hitting my numbers, my revenue, my profit, fantastic, I'm on the high end of the scale. Horizontal axes is the B goals. And those would be those seven words from Hershen or the nine words from SeaWorld that we would measure and we would have results is this leader hitting these nine words or not. And, and so you could be low to high there. If you were high on the values piece and high on the do goals, meaning the financial results, you got the best raise. Whatever the raise is, you were at the high end. If you didn't hit either, you were at the low end and most likely you would not be with the company very long. All the time from a leadership perspective was spent in the upper left or lower right-hand box where your either high on the do goals and low on the B goals or high on the B goals and low on the do goals. That's where we as coaches would try to get the employees or the leaders into the upper right hand box. Obviously the upper right hand box where you're hitting both your do goals, you're hitting your numbers and you're also hitting your culture numbers. Those were the future leaders. Those were the people that had to be the ones getting promoted. And there is so much damage done when someone who's just hitting the financial numbers only and causing high turnover, high dissatisfaction, low engagement, and they were promoted, it just causes all kinds of culture inconsistencies. And if they're around long enough, their do goals also start to plummet, but it usually takes, it's a lagging indicator. It takes longer from the num for the numbers to drop than the culture scores. Culture scores would drop first, the financial results would come second. So that's how we handle base pay. With bonuses, Think about, again, you don't have to do it the way SeaWorld or Hershen did it, but with bonuses, there had to, there was a threshold that had to be hit. So if you, let's just say you hit your do goals, you hit your financial targets, but your B goals, you were only like 50% of top score. Depending on company, we wouldn't pay out any bonuses until the person got to 75% threshold. So again, putting our money where our mouth is. So a leader, a middle manager couldn't be running over their employees or just doing the wrong long-term things to hit their numbers. They had, to, they had to do both well. And then the last one is promotions. And again, I mean, I, I already alluded to it once. You've, we have to promote the people who are both hitting our do goals and our B goals, the numbers and the culture numbers. If you don't, it's, it's just gonna break down over time. And I know it's not easy. And I know a lot of us were in short-term situations. We gotta turn the numbers around quickly, but I still feel that for all of us, our real value as senior leaders, middle, even middle management, it's, it's a two to three to five year window. From a CEO's perspective, it's more of a five year window of how long does it take to get the, the value turnaround, the value creation. So. That, that's the, the promoting and uh, as a result of the value. So just in summary, I wanna go back over just a very high level. It starts with defining it specifically, both the vision and the culture. Then it's teaching it repeatedly and teaching it, I didn't say this really, but teaching it to the point that you're sick of it. I mean, if you're, if you're not tired of it, you're probably not doing it enough because that's the role of leaders. If we're not doing it, who else is going to? Then measuring it robustly, reviewing it consistently, and then rewarding it constantly. And I think my encouragement would be as much as we want to spend all of our time you know, out on the parks, we have to do that, but we also have to make sure what we're trying to accomplish is ex extremely clear to everybody else so that they can be busy on the front line taking care of the customer. And um, 
I, I hope that there's a tidbit in there for all of you to take from these five lessons, these five steps and apply it to your own situation. And I, again, I wanna end with encouragement to you that I know this has been a tough year, year and a half, but we're, we are through the worst of it. And it's great to see the parks opening back up again, but this is the time to do a gut check of what has to pivot both from a vision standpoint and a value standpoint in our company. And I think, you know, hopefully we're all off to the races now. But with that, um, that's been about a half an hour. I'm, I am all in to answer any questions either about what I've said or just any other questions you have about the industry. So, so David, I'll turn it back over to you and let you uh, call on people. Okay, and, and what we'll do at this point is um, if on, on, the, on the Zoom screen, if you go down the bottom, you can raise your hand for, to be called on. Uh, but I actually, uh, I had submitted out to a number of people that I knew could not be on today, Joel, and uh, there are a number of questions that they had. And I, I had one myself that, um, that we talked about briefly before everybody got on. So I'll, I'll lead off. And then uh, if someone has a question they'd like to ask, just uh, toggle the, the hand raise button and I'll do my best to locate that and call on you. But uh, so th the first one that I, that I talked about was obviously your book uh, was based on your management, the management culture at Hurston when you were there, which was pre-existing prior to your arrival there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also with a longstanding uh, staff that uh, grew up in that culture and you were kind of inserted into that. SeaWorld was seemingly under fire from the moment you got there to literally, in some instances, maybe still, maybe not as, as much as it was, but um, were you there long enough to begin implementing that which you were probably very passionate about and how receptive was that? And this isn't to make any kind of a negative uh, reference to SeaWorld at all. I'm just coming from the perspective of it was a different organization, a different place, uh, dealing with much different circumstances and without a history of operating in that model. Uh, so it, tucked in within there's some, some question, yeah. but uh, was that something that you were able to begin implementing or was it just your, your printout fires the whole time? It's, uh, it's a great question. Uh, the short answer, and I'm going to expand on, expand on it. The short answer is if I had to do it all over again, I think I spent too much time um, putting out immediate fires and it detracted me. And I don't mean the business itself. There were so many distractions of activist investors, not to be confused with animal activists, but activist investors asking for changes either on board structure or things that just, just really absorbed a lot of time. Um, probably spent too much time with animal activists in the beginning. I, I should have um, focus more on the culture pieces immediately because it took me about a year to get to the things I'm talking about here. And we had my second and third year, we had tremendous impact on employee culture and employee engagement. Um, when I got to SeaWorld, the employee engagement was really low. Uh, the company was under attack and most millennials didn't want to work there. Board members didn't want to be with the company because we were under so many, so much attack. So people were tending to flee. And once I brought in a really good HR leader, his name was Jack Roddy, he started teaching our millennial employees all the great that SeaWorld did. And we spent a lot of time teaching not only what, what SeaWorld did effectively for animal welfare, but also establishing our nine words of culture, which included taking care of the planet and included taking care of animals. And we saw a huge improvement in our employee engagement in the second and third year. Uh, the first year, not so much, because it was just, we were under fire. Um, if I had to do it all over again, I probably would have not let myself be distracted by some of those external forces and focus on the culture piece faster because it's the fastest way to change your guest experience. And we had a, we had a pretty marginal guest experience for a while there. Um, as far as Hershen, I will just say this about Hershen. They, I would never and never want to take credit, as you alluded to, for, for what Jack and Pete established. What, what, I can, what I felt I did really well there, per Jack's request, is put a vernacular to their culture. And 
what Hershen was struggling with is we acquired other companies, their cultures were typically horrible and they were not performing very well. And so our job was to make them feel family oriented like Hershen's. And so they didn't have a process to do so by putting those seven words of love, the verb um, into Hershen, it, it really had great results. The, and the last thing I'll, I'll add to, to answer your question, we did not follow the same exact word set at, at SeaWorld because they were different organizations. I mean, the, the Hershens were very, they're, they're both, uh, their faith is really important to them. They are Christians. They took the seven words of love out of 1 Corinthians 13 and, and made it a, a verb, a behavior. SeaWorld, entirely different culture, right? There are a lot of, a lot of scientists. Um, the, the faith element wasn't going to work in that culture as much. So, but we took similar kind of words that still were about dignity of human beings, dignity towards animals, and made that um, a, a very defined definition that started turning the culture around. Um, so that's, it was much harder at SeaWorld, but also in hindsight, I wish I had gotten at it faster than I did. Anybody have any questions? I've got, uh, I've got uh, about four or five of them, but I don't want to be the one dominating the conversation. So is there, uh, is there anyone else has a question in the meantime? And ask I'll anything. On, I'll lead off on number two. And these are no particular order. They came from five, four or five different people. Uh, have you ever had the company culture, or I'm sorry, the uh, company values, the state of company values sort of thrown back at yourself by an employee on their way out or to another employee that uh, had to uh, escort them on their way out? Well, the short answer is yes. Um, we, here's where I, look, I, I don't ever want to, uh, if someone's on the call feels differently about that, we can, we can openly disagree and that's fine. I, I never took the lawyer's advice on escorting people out. Um, we, would, we would cut off their email so they couldn't do something damaging to our servers or to the company, but to protect the dignity of the individual, we always let, waited till the end of the day or in, at Hershen, in most cases, we actually gave people like a, a, a three to six month notice and allow them to look for a job while they were still with the company, which is a huge advantage. Now there's some legal risk there, of course, but we felt that the advantage outweighed the disadvantages and, and never, I've never been burned by that philosophy in my life. Um, I will say that there's no way when you let someone go, they're, they're probably not going to throw back. Well, how, how is this um, being patient or how is this being kind? The, that's usually an anger. And uh, typically, you know, there, it was never, and it should never be a surprise. And if it was, it was a mistake. Um, people shouldn't be surprised when they're let go. And usually if there has been a track record of one to three conversations, you don't get too much, uh, too much thrown, thrown back at you. But you asked me, has it ever happened? Yes, but I've had, a, I would say a lot more of the opposite, which is people thankful for how they were treated and felt like um, it, it wasn't a surprise to them. I, I will tell you the hardest one, and I, I still get, uh, I'll, I'll get emotional if I think about it, but at SeaWorld, we had to go through three major layoffs and to you know, be in the parking lot as some of those people were leaving, especially people who, I remember one lady, and I don't want to say her name, but you know, she was an analyst, probably wasn't paid very much. It was critical for her family, and you know that. There's just no way that feels good. And, and, uh, but sometimes you ha we have to do those things to protect the organization. Otherwise it, it, you know, the benefit of many may outweigh the benefit of one or two. And that's just the tough part of leadership. But I will say there were a lot more of people just thanking us for the way we went about doing it than the people throwing it back at you on their way out. I would say it's probably, you know, hundred to one. Well, it's a good question. And it's a question a lot of people have, of, you know, if you talk about leading with love, which is what the Hirschian values are, how can you talk about that and still let somebody go? I say, how, how can you have truthfulness 
and trustworthiness and not let people go sometimes. Sometimes people shouldn't be in the organization and it, it hurts all those who are performing that are in the organization. And if you don't do it, the good people start to leave. So um, that's, that's as honest as I can be about it. All right, Joel, the, the line has grown to four uh, and I'll just call on them as they, as they popped up on my screen to be Joy, Deshaun, Joe, and then Rick. So Joy, I'm going to unmute you. All right, Joy, can you hurry out? Hello. Um, I purchased the book Love Works right when it first came out, which we know has been, I don't know, is it 10 or 12 years ago? And at that time, I wasn't in a leadership position. And it was a bit frustrating for me to have learned of a better way. But I didn't know how do you communicate that to people who are in your upline, to your supervisors, how do you start to get them? I mean, can you change the culture from a position where you're like a first level manager or maybe even a frontline employee? It's a great question, Joy. And it's, it's one of the most common questions people ask me. Um, and it's a great one is, is can I impact the culture when I'm a frontline play, uh, employee or a middle manager, the answer is absolutely you can. You, you influence the people around you, how you interact and you, your department or your division or your property. Um, and I would say do that relentlessly until it gets to the point where uh, if you feel like the lack of leadership support uh, keeps you from being able to do it broadly or it's, it's, it's bringing down your department or your area because leadership doesn't get it and doesn't support it. And I, I think you do have a, a difficult decision to make. And um, without going into too much detail, for me at, at SeaWorld, um, we had actually, if, if, if you looked at our sales results um, the day I left, we were up significantly, you know, 50% California, I think 12% overall. It wasn't that the numbers weren't there. It was a, it was a violent disagreement with a couple board members over uh, how deep our cost cuts would be and how many people we laid off. And, and uh, I just felt we were getting to the point where we we're cutting into bone and not muscle. And um, I just, there was such a difference in philosophy. It was time for me to go. And I, I would say, I can't make that pick for any individual on the phone. I will just say there, there is a time that if you're fighting it so hard and it's causing turnover and lack of impact in your department or lack of engagement, you know, at some point people have to leave. As far as how to influence your leaders, I mean, I, to give your leaders or the leaders in, in the organizations that people are frustrated with their senior leaders, and that's pretty common tale. In, in their defense, sometimes they don't know there's a better way. I will tell you for, for 40 years, well, that's not, no, 20 years, until I was 40 years old, auto industry, I never saw a leader like Jack or Pete Hirsch, and I didn't know that type of leadership existed. I only saw fear-based autocratic leadership. It wasn't until I worked at with the Hershians, I understand, I stood that you could be extremely profitable, have great returns on investment, which we did, and and still treat people that way. So whether it's, you know, slipping, I, I've had some employees slip a copy of my book uh, uh, under the, the door of a leader or put it on their desk without necessarily give it to him personally, because I know that that comes at some risk. Hey, you need this book because you're not a great leader. Um, but I've had that happen or have them listen to other leader podcasts of people like a, like a John Maxwell, let's say, who, who has a similar kind of philosophy. That's, that's the way you can kind of do it. But um, you can have an impact, but hopefully your leaders are supporting you enough that you want to stay. All right. And uh, next we'll go to Deshaun, who I recall from our last call. Uh, you're from that, the Netherlands, correct? Hold on, I'm trying to. Okay. Yes, that's right. <laughs> okay. 
Um, I was wondering if you have some tips for a student like me who uh, would like to become a manager in operations uh, for a market leading theme park. Well, I think, I know it, it sounds cliche, but if you, if you know what you want and you're a student in college, I assume, you see you're in mm -hmm. college still, you're ahead of 95% of the people on earth. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know what I want. I, I still want to be a pro baseball player when I was in college at your age. And obviously that didn't work out. So um, you're way ahead of the game. And unfortunately you're looking at a really difficult time post COVID. But if you know what you want, the industry is going to come back. It's already coming back. And I would just be diligent and keep sending out your resume over and over again, be a student of the business, try to get in front of people, you will find the opportunity um, because the industry needs great people. And for whatever reason, most of the people in it tended to kind of fall into it and then they fell in love with it, which mm -hmm. is what happened to me and most people in the industry. The fact that you are setting out for it It'll happen, and just be patient. And and uh, um, you know we're all we're all connected on this call. You know, just just make it known, and uh, you will find you will find your way. I can almost guarantee it because you're way ahead of the game. And then once you do get a job, work hard. I mean, that's just common sense. Work hard, do more than others, and treat the guests like they're king. And uh, you'll always win with that. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you very much. All right, uh, Joe is next. Joe, you have your question on the on the chat, but did you want me to unmute you to ask it? I'll go ahead and ask it. Uh, thank you, Joel. This is great so far. Um, so short of leaving an industry or a business that doesn't have the buy-in, as a middle manager, how do you implement those changes in the big goals without top executives buying in? Yeah. You know, it's Joe, it admittedly, it's difficult. I mean, I would start with trying to convince them because every great organization and it's proven and I, the data, I mean, let me, let me just go there for a second. Hershen, when I was at Hershen, the board demanded uh, a lot of financial results of how are we performing versus other players like Cedar Fair, Six Flags. Um, we didn't, we didn't, you know, Disney was a different category. They're, they're super huge. Our, our returns were as good or better than any of them. Now, sometimes our profit margins weren't as high because we were paying people more. We didn't want the turnover. We wanted consistent people not turning over. But we invested less in our capital. So when you took basically slightly less margins, but less capital invested, our returns were as good or better than any of them. And those are two great companies. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Cedar Fair is one of my favorite companies. Um, so it's not anything negative towards them, very positive. We were right with them. So it's, it's, it's false to say that a focus on B goals and a focus on your people hurts profitability, it's just not true. And, and the numbers prove that. So I would go to them with that and it'll, if you focus on culture, it will decrease turnover, it'll increase the engagement level of your employees, meaning they're working harder, they're more engaged, they, you know, when you're disengaged, you start worrying more about what you're doing outside of work than at work. And I just saw that over and over again, both at SeaWorld and Hershen, I couldn't believe how passionate people were because they bought into the culture. So I would try to convince your leaders first. If that doesn't work, you can have your own, you know, I can't imagine anybody would fight this, but you could have your own set of B goals for your department and just establish it for your team. If they come and challenge you on that and you're getting results, then we've got a problem. And then I think you have to think about what, what you're gonna do. But I, even leaders who don't get it, on the B goal side, as long as you're hitting your due goals or close to it, they're they're fine. Unfortunately, the typical they're too short term focused, and uh, I gotta be careful how I say this. But one thing I've learned in my long career is any fool 
can increase results quickly. Uh, you, you just slash cost, you slash quality, you, you bring in fewer people and the lines are longer. Um, that works for a season, but then those people who are pissed over, pissed off over the low quality, long lines, they don't come back next year. And then it, you know, you know, the whole game, you guys know it as well, but that's why I just think they've got to have a long-term perspective. And if they do, they should be on your side. And if not create it yourself, and if they push back, then, then you have a, a decision to make. So hopefully that'll empower you to at least have some change within your sphere of influence. Right. And Rick from, I'm sorry. I said that was a great question. Rick from Fort Wayne uh, Children's Museum or Children's Zoo. This, I'm trying to unmute you. Can, can you unmute yourself from your end? Yes, there. Okay. Hey, Joel, good to see you. We worked together back in the SeaWorld days. Absolutely. Good um, to see you. Good to see you. One story the group might appreciate is uh, Joel and I, we were in a seven, eight hour meeting together and the whole team had to present numbers and data and it was just a long flat day, but I got to uh, pitch a brand new summer, summer program for the park. And suddenly the energy just exploded in the room and you could see Joel was really excited about a brand new program. And he said, well, how much do you need to pull this off? And I told him the number, which was pretty significant. He said, let's make that work. And, and I believe to this day, the park is still doing that program. So kind of a fun, fun yeah. memory. That is such a great memory. And, um, you know, Rick, he's talking about our, our electric, uh, what do we call it? Electric, electric ocean. Electric ocean. So, you know, SeaWorld obviously was in a situation where we had to pivot away from animal shows for the long term. I mean, no one wants to bet that uh, marine mammals in captivity is the long term answer. Uh, at least it didn't look like that at the time. So, we pivoted by adding festivals that were about animals, but it was you know, a lot of fun and energy at night and Rick presented it. And literally within a year, we had it implemented there and we had it all the parks. It's still going on today. I mean, frankly, most of the things that our SeaWorld is hitting it out of the park on were things like the festivals or um, just huge increases in food and beverage, just bringing in food and beverage from all around the world in those festivals. When you don't have a ton of capital for huge new rides. It was just a wonderful idea. And I appreciate that because I think you know, as, as leaders, when we see a good idea, it's just time to make it happen quickly. And certainly SeaWorld had a lot of, a lot of crises. I'm glad to see you're landed. Uh, how are you liking your new gig? <laughs> Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's a little bit different from San Diego, <laughs> but it's good. I'm happy to be here. But I did have a quick question. You know, I'm, I'm coming into an organization that has had the same leadership for about 26 years. And so what do you think, or how would you recommend you start the process to identify uh, new values and to create B goals? You know, is there a way, or how would you recommend you even start that? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, they have to support it. And if, if they support it, that's huge. And, um, and I, I feel like I'm, I don't mean to push my, my book. I mean, the book clearly articulates why it's important, but there are other books out there, whether it's Jim Collins, you know, Good to Great. There are a lot of books that talk about why culture is important. Um, the, the key thing is making them part of the process. If I had to answer it crisply, that they have to be part of it. And it would, if it's a family owned business, even a family member or two that aren't involved in leadership, like when we did it at Hershend, Chris Hershend, who at the time was not involved in leadership, but he was on the board for the family. He was involved in me every step of the way because to go through all that work without knowing you had the family support or your CEO support is probably time wasted. Usually a CEO or some senior leaders are too busy. They may not be involved day to day in that process, but as long as they support who's on the team, so get their buy-in as to who's on the team to develop them, and you say, we'll come back to you at 50% point, 75% point, 100% point and get your feedback along the way so that they don't feel left out, then just don't take it too far without their buying. But you can do all the, you know, the, the, those meetings of getting all the people together, take a lot of time, but take it to your CEO and your family member and get their process check points along the way. 
as far as in those meetings themselves of developing the words, um, I think of making sure they're cross-functional. So just think of, for lack of a better term, diversity, which is a lightning rod word today, but as a diverse group as possible, but not just race or gender. It's time with the company, departments. Do you have attractions people and engineers and salespeople? Do you have first-year people, five-year people, 20-year people? You get the point. The more diversity on that team, the better. And I would keep it to kind of under 10 people because if it gets beyond that, it gets very cumbersome. And then once you come up with a set of words through that process and, and you touch base with your CEO and your family member, then go out to another layer of the organization and another layer and kind of get the feedback. At, let's say you take the, whatever that 10 group, 10 people group came up with, you go to the management team, get their feedback, then you go out to middle managers and you go out to the, the front line and make them feel part of the process. The whole thing takes Literally, it can take a whole season to get through it. I know people are thinking, man, I don't have that kind of time. You can do it in 90 days, but I think the better processes take about six months or so, honestly, to do it. And then um, the other advice I would give on when I, when I talk about teaching it repeatedly and measuring it and rewarding it, um, at least at Hershend, and I did it in a, a ministry I'm, I'm on the a chairman of, we didn't measure it for a couple of years. We just put it out there and had it as a discussion point. We want you to behave in these seven words way. We want you to be patient, we want you to be kind. And then we would talk about it at the review, but there wasn't actually a robust measurement system until people got used to it. And then we started measuring it. And then we started putting our money where our mouth is. So we kind of eased into it till people got fully comfortable. The whole thing honestly takes to really do it right and to get the optimum result, it takes pretty consistently three years to go from beginning to end. And um, matter of fact, when I was interviewed by the board at SeaWorld, they asked how long it would take. I said, this is a three year turnaround. And if you expect it faster, you know, you're smoking crack basically, but I didn't say it that way, but um, unfortunately some of them listened to me and some of them didn't, but it's, it's not a short-term fix, it, it takes time. And, but that's, that's the best advice I could give. If there's uh, someone that has a question that's well enough, let me know. Uh, in the meantime, there was a couple others that I'll, I'll go ahead and read off and maybe they'll conjure up another question in someone's, someone's mind. Uh, since the, and I'm, I'm going to add a little bit to of my thoughts to this. And so I hope that the person that asked this, one of me asked this, this covers their basis. Uh, do you feel that it is easier or harder to arrange uh, and set culture expectations since the pandemic hit? Now, I know that uh, Kyle, he's up in the right-hand corner of my screen. He, he's at Kings Island, or I assume he is, that's what his background is. Uh, last year when the, the state allowed parks to reopen in July, uh, I could imagine that theme parks are used to hiring thousands of employees or thinking we don't know how many we need to hire, we're going to hire too many, too few because I don't think anybody knew what the demand was going to be when, when the parks were reopened. I was one of the people that was kind of surprised that the crowds in the beginning were as light as they were. And it, it was kind of a slow burn in, in Kyle, if, if you work there, you may be able to speak to that. But um, it wasn't until late in the season that, that I would say crowds hit maybe 75%. Now flip the switch to uh, their opening weekend last weekend we didn't they open on Saturday. We didn't go Saturday morning. We went Saturday evening. Uh, but my daughter works down the street at, uh, at a Great Wolf Lodge location. And I drove past their parking lot on the way in. I have not seen that many cars in the parking lot. I maybe in, in several years. And we went later on. And they have an old roller coaster there that said uh, it's, it's as old as a park is. Mm -hmm. I've never waited in a line for that longer than 10 minutes in my life. And I believe someone said at one point during the day, it was a 90 minute wait. Wow. I, I saw someone in their, um, their management staff and, and spoke to them near the end of the evening and just say, how do you even plan for this? Uh, because I, and I can only assume that they didn't think it was going to be as, as uh, strong of a response as it was because there are a lot of places that, that ran out of food that day. Yeah. But so how, in trying to maintain some sort of a culture structure, uh, in trying to to maintain, especially when your when your staff changes a lot anyway, yeah. especially when you can't even determine what your crowd size is going to be to determine what kind of staff you need, how would you even 
begin putting that culture together? You know, there's no doubt, David, that I know I have my five steps, but I also think this is the most difficult time, again, that the, that the industry has gone through to do what I'm talking about. But part of the reason I felt important to talk about it is that we don't forget about it. Because what I've seen, I think we've all seen it, whether it's air, uh, airline companies, whether it's restaurants out in the general public, um, the service levels are not what they used to be. And um, part of it's just economics. They can't bring in enough people in and their volumes down. But I think it goes beyond just lower staff levels. I, you know, Attitudes aren't as good. I think masks cause a problem just with interpretation. So it's, let's just face it, it's, it, it's gonna be a really rough re-entry. And don't, don't beat yourself up too much over it. But the reason I went back to the basics of you know, those five steps is to remind everybody, oh yeah, I know that's important. Focus on it, but also don't beat yourself up so much that you just you know, get, to, get depressed in the process because we have to just keep taking a step at a time. And whatever employees you do have, make sure they get trained, make sure you teach it to them, make sure they understand it. Whoever is there, make sure we're asking how they feel about the culture, but it's going to be rocky and it's going to be inconsistent. And um, so don't just know that and accept that, but don't, it also is not an excuse to go back to the basics and do the right thing. Cause at least for me as a consumer, I'm kind of tired of going into places and having to wait when I don't really feel like there should be a reason I have to wait. I think it's almost an excuse for poor service. I'm not talking about theme parks. I'm talking about you know restaurants and so forth. So um, be relentless on the basics and on those five steps, but at the same time, cut yourself some slack knowing that it's going to be difficult. And I don't think we'll be back. You know, this season's like a just a test season to kind of get reopened and get going. I don't think we'll be back, you know, until the following year or two from now, honestly. Kyle, one question. Last Saturday was just the, um, what do you call it? The season pass holders. This yeah. is the weekend for Yeah, so last weekend was um, our, our season pass, pass holder preview weekends. Um, and then this coming Saturday, this coming weekend will be opening weekend. What's the expectation for crowds this week? Because uh, obviously with Ohio weather, you're open only a couple hours and close on Sunday. Yeah, who knows, but... Um, I, we were, the, the park was really happy. I think they were really happy with what they, they saw, um, the past weekend. And, uh, it's, I, I think it's looking good for, I, I think we kind of know that we, that Cedar Fair really looked at, um, you know, they, they just kind of counted on like, you know, people are ready to come back to parks, you know, they're, they're tired of, um, sitting at home and, uh, I mean, everyone's kind of just ready to come back as, and, and as they feel safe too, of course. Um, but, you know, with vaccines rolling out, and um, I, I think we can really start looking up from here. Yeah, yeah. I want to echo Kyle's comment. Here in Fort Wayne, we opened a couple of weeks ago and we have had gangbuster attendance uh, off the charts. People want to get out. They want to be with their kids. They're over this thing. We don't require masks. We highly recommend masks. I would say that probably 99% of our guests are not wearing masks. They're done, um, but they're having a great day and we're happy to see the attendance. At the, at the park last weekend, I'm gonna guess, well, the state of Ohio dropped the masking requirements outdoors a couple of weeks ago. And I'm gonna guess, I saw maybe a dozen people in the span of a couple hours had masks on. And then um, just a couple of days ago, maybe a day or two ago, they announced that uh, masking and distancing requirements are going away June 2nd. And I believe, I don't know if this was announced beforehand, but uh, it was the first time I saw it publicly today that uh, Kings Island was the only Cedar Fair Park that I know of that was advertising more or less a full deck of activities coming up. Grand Carnival is returning, uh, the Halloween event and Winterfest were all announced this week, unless they were announced before and I just didn't see it. So it's, it's a it's a good good sense that things are coming back and, and coming back strong probably. 
I've heard that too, just talking to SeaWorld friends and uh, Hershen friends, heard the same thing. They're basically at capacity at which they're operating. Now, the, that capacity is different and I don't, I'm not sure what's public information or not. So I have to feel, I have to be careful, but some, you know, the, the, the percentage of the park that's reopening is different between both companies, but the mass requirement uh, is gone. And um, I, I think the capacity issues will, will solve themselves pretty quickly because the people are coming are either they're vaccinated or they're comfortable with it. So um, I, I think we will have a, a great summer, but it's going to be a little bumpy. All right. You got Albert. Uh, you've got a question. Hey, Albert. Joel, how are you, sir? Fantastic. Good to see you. <laughs> well, if you're not going to plug the book, I am. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> um, so two two versions, of course, the the version with uh, with Hershen, uh, and then the version with uh, with SeaWorld and and some others that uh, other things that have come up in time. You want to get both. Uh, they're great books uh, and uh, can go a long way in helping any organization. Um, but my question, so. Um, it's been over a decade now since, since the book, uh, for, or close to anyway, close to a decade since the first book first came out. And uh, you've written it, of course, with, with your theme park experience in mind, since that was at the forefront. Uh, now that you know, you've, you've moved on from the theme park industry and have done uh, some of your own, own stuff and, and with the Rethink Group, um, how far has this reached into other industries? And did you ever think that it could, that it could go past uh, kind of the attractions industry and, and was that the main goal in writing it was to reach as many people as possible well this first of all it's good to see you, albert can I, can I just ask quickly where are you now uh, uh springfield missouri uh, so just right up the street from branson uh, still got family in the area uh, i've actually kind of done the opposite of, of you I'm, I'm now in the auto industry um <laughs> so uh, uh and um you know kind of to, to answer kind of the multiple questions that have been asked about implementing um, you know, I, I live and breathe, uh, what Joel is talking about in these books. Uh, I've seen it work firsthand, um, multiple times, uh, in multiple situations. And, um, when I found myself in the, the automotive industry, I, I wanted to implement love works as, as, as strongly as possible. And, and I'm very much a, a line level employee. There's, there's no uh, influence that I have directly. Uh, but I have seen, love working in my current organization uh, without anybody knowing that love is working, uh, if you will. Uh, just uh, like you had said earlier, the way you treat people, uh, the way you treat your, your guests, your customers, uh, even the way you treat your management. Um, there is such a thing as managing up and, uh, and you can implement these things in Joel's book um, just by living it. You don't, you don't have to have anything specific written down processes, procedures, but if you live it, it will be infectious uh, and it will catch on in your organization. Yeah, and well, I, I appreciate that, Albert. And you know, for those of you on the call who, who haven't read it, uh, you know, the, the title is, it's, it's a title that scares some people because they think of love, the emotion, and it, it's not, a, the book goes into it. Unfortunately, the English language is pretty limited in how it talks about love, but the Greeks have four different versions of the word love, agape and eros and store and phylos. So this is about agape, it's about a behavior. It's not about how you feel about somebody, it's about how you treat them. And that's a really big differentiator. As far as answering your question, Albert, the, re the reason I wrote the book is, and you hear it on this phone call, even the young man who's still looking for a job or starting to look for a job in the, in the industry, I was, I was 20 years as a leader before I understood that you could lead this way and be successful financially. I, you know, there's, a, there's a knock on it that, oh, you're, you're being too nice or you're not holding people accountable. None of those knocks are true, because, but it gets knocked sometimes. I, it, I wrote the book so that other people like me who felt like, man, I know leadership should be different. I know it should be better than it is. I know cultures should be better than they are. And I wrote the book to give people hope, basically. And all these questions that are kind of different versions of, well, how can I influence my culture when my senior leaders don't get it or um, the owners don't get it? I'm just encouraging you that either help them get it 
help them see it or, or you can find organizations where it exists because it does work and the great, greatest organizations in the world make it happen. And um, the, the second answer to your question is I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised at how many different types of businesses have implemented this. I, you know, I still consult, I still speak, I still help organizations. I, you know, I'm, I'm up to probably you know, 50 some companies that I've helped do it. Um, mostly outside of the theme park industry, a lot of automotive dealerships actually, which is surprising because that that industry needs it big time. But um, you can really differentiate yourself in the in the auto business by treating guests with respect and dignity. So yeah, I'm pleased with it, and it's it's been a lot of different places. But I I mostly wrote it to give people like you and others on the call hope that there can be a different way. And you know, that's what Jack and Pete taught me. And hopefully, you know, until I'm taken away from this earth, I'm going to keep pounding the pavement with it because it, it makes a big difference in people's lives. But thanks, Albert. It's great to see you. Let's, let's, let's touch base offline. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, thank you, everybody involved, for bringing Joel on. Um, if this is the first time hearing Joel speak for you guys, hopefully you understand what the buzz is all about. Uh, very encouraging uh, and very uh, heartfelt and we appreciate it uh, you're welcome and watch the old version of undercover boss you'll see albert that was that's still out there albert somewhere netflix. yeah uh netflix uh and i think hulu even so uh it's a uh, surprising uh a decade later i had hair uh it's <laughs> <laughs> uh but uh that's but yeah thank <laughs> thanks joel have a good day <laughs> thanks albert I've got one more question on the sheet from another person. And, and then if anyone else has any questions, I mean, we're, we're a little over time, but uh, th this question comes, it, it was rather short order. So I'll try to fill in some, what I think they were talking about. Uh, they, they are in HR position that is charged with uh, leading some of the employee culture. And they're finding a lot of uh, issues with being consistent with the culture, with all these we'll call it social demands that keep coming at them. They, that they, their words or seem to get added weekly, uh, just from external things covering the last year or so. And are there, are there any resources that you would point them to uh, that are decent in how to implement and uh, maintain culture with a number of different factors coming in that uh, were never pre present in years past? Yeah, you know, I, I can only guess what what the what that question is behind the question. And I will tell you what they're a little more explicit on that, but I've I've well, is it is it more the, the diversity and equality issues? Um and a couple layers back the underneath that. Cause I I I will tell you my, my actually my my next uh I'm gonna write a book on these five steps, but I'm also gonna I'm gonna team up with a really, really sharp lady who's head of HR for a number of different companies, Fortune 500 companies, to address this, the issues of the diversity issue, the equality issue, the, um, you know, the whole DEI movement, so to speak, which I think overall is a really good thing. Uh, but I also think that it puts a lot of extra stress on managers. The short answer, all I can say at this time, and I you know, whoever it is has asked that question, keep following me because I am going to come out with resources about it. I think simple changes to the employee survey can add some elements of finding out, do people feel, do people of different colors, different genders, different um, ages, let's say, for lack of a better word, do they feel safe in the culture? Do they feel like there is equality? Do they feel like they have equal opportunity? And to add those questions in, especially in exit interviews. I mean, I see so many companies are boneheaded. They don't talk to their people who are leaving and why. I mean, what a, what a significant source of information. And you will find out in those exit interviews if it's handled by the right person. Typically, um, you know, I'm finding that uh, you know, we think we're creating an equal culture, but sometimes people of different colors don't feel safe. They don't feel there's equal opportunity, even though, let's say in my case, a white male leader, I feel like there is equal opportunity. They don't feel that. So just having that dialogue and adding it to the questionnaire so you know how people feel 
is probably the first step and you'll get a lot of information that way. And the goal should be to create a diverse culture, uh, a culture where everyone feels safe and everybody feels equal in the opportunity uh, by which they can achieve in the organization. So that's the, my quick answer, but um, the more scientific results, I, you know, I would say in the next year, I'm gonna have all that stuff out with this partner who's really bright and I'm really looking forward to it. I think there's a huge opportunity for it because people are searching for answers. And the last one on my sheet, and then uh, I know I don't know if there's uh, other questions that are out there. I'm looking through. I don't see any on the on the chat. Uh, as far as the the way of leading uh, that type of leadership style at Hersend, am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what were employee retention rates, and what was the average tenure of the employees as compared to peer organizations of yeah. similar size? You know the the this. The turnover rate for anyone who had stayed more than a year, because let's face it, a lot of seasonal people come in and out, they're just working for the summer and they're you know, off to college or whatever. If you eliminate that class, it was very low, like in the in the 20%. If they had stayed three years or longer, it was it was less than five percent. And I've never seen anything like it, including SeaWorld. Um now, SeaWorld was very low turnover at the senior level, but they had more at the frontline level than Hershen did. But again, I will, I will say it is it is easier in a private company, but a lot of you are with private companies. Hershen um, was way ahead of its time in that they they did pay more and they were at you know 10 or $15 an hour way before it was popular. If you had worked with the company three years or more, you pretty much could have a working wage if you were full time. And that kept turnover low. And that's why our margins maybe were a little lower, but it paid for itself. I mean, our, our employees knew the guests, they knew the season pass holders by name. Um, you'd go in a store and, and they, they would recognize you. So I know it pays for itself because I've seen our returns. And I, I know the results of Hershen. Um, but it, it, uh, it, again, it takes time. And, uh, it, it, not all leaders get it, and you got to have some patience to get there. Again, three years for the ultimate turnaround. All right, is there anyone else who would have any questions? I know the hour is late. <laughs> well, I really appreciate it, David. And, um, you know, if somebody had a burning question, they were a little uh, maybe didn't want to ask in front of everybody, which I understand that. If you just email it to, to David or contact, reach out to David. Um, David, you get a hold of me. I'll, I'll answer it um, in writing to people because I think it's really important that you get your questions answered. I think it's a great service, David, what you've provided here. And uh, we'll, I'll get you that outline so you can send it out to the rest of the team. But I encourage you to keep doing this. I think it's great dialogue. I really love the Q&A. It was great. Uh, we, we look to be doing something similar to this every month and coming up in the fall, adding topical, it may be some topical things before then just to see how it works out. But uh, I, for those of you who are on the platform, just continue to check it out and engage with it. Uh, those of you who aren't, why not? But uh, anyway, it's, a, it's something that uh, we hope to uh, get moving in a, on a broad basis going forward. I know that for seasonal parks, going through the summer is kind of a it just can get a little noisy, especially given the year that we've had, no one knowing, okay, what's going to happen the next day. But as we, we uh, plow through summer, and I, I don't want to say headed towards fall because we're not even to summer yet, but uh, there'll be uh, some, some things we're working on to implement and uh, hope to have, uh, hope to really make this a valuable resource tool for attractions industry professionals. And Joel, I thank you for, for taking the time, coming on and sharing with us. And I think everybody who is on here, I think, um, yeah, th th as far as retention is concerned, I think we only lost a handful and most of the people stuck on here to the end. So I uh, appreciate your time and uh, your transparen transparency and your answers. Well, it's good to see so many people I know. And please keep in touch, all of you. I'd love to know where you're headed in your careers. And thanks, David. It's great, great service and look forward to speaking again. All right. Thank thanks. You. Appreciate it.